Before we start today's show, we want to invite you to stick around at the end of the episode to enjoy a preview of a new podcast that premieres on July 14th. As the industry's exclusive cannabis podcast network, MJ Bulls is proud to present Women Leading in Cannabis. Join host Kira Reed each week for inspirational discussions with women who are leading the cannabis industry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Deadhead Cannabis Show. Jim Marty here, reporting from the Cannabis World Congress in Boston, Massachusetts. I've got my partner, Larry Mishkin, out in Chicago. Hey, Jim, how are you doing today? Very good. Good. Well, we have a lovely day in Chicago. Not all the uh, cannabis fun and excitement that you're having, but uh, enough other uh, business to keep us busy, so it's all good. Um, Jim, I'd like to uh, introduce you and our uh, audience to a good friend of mine who's agreed to come on the show and chat with us today for a few minutes. Her name is Andy Greenberg. Um, Andy's from San Francisco, and she's an owner and operator of a company called Society Jane, which I will let her talk about in a minute. It's a very, very cool business that she and her partners have put together, uh, and they seem to be doing very well, which is uh, always positive to hear about marijuana-related businesses. Um, Andy and I have known each other since back into the late 1970s. We went to summer camp together uh, up in northern Wisconsin. We went to the University of Michigan together, uh, and we've seen more than one or two Grateful Dead shows together. So uh, I think she probably Mm -hmm. fits in very well. Andy, nice to have you on the show. Yes, Andy, welcome. Thank you, Larry. Glad to have you aboard. Thank you, Jim. Nice to meet you. And Larry, it's one of the things that's on the top. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Everything that's you know, top of mind has been the uh, the vape ban crisis. So, uh, Andy, why don't you tell us about your business, and uh, then we'll we'll talk about uh, how things are moving along with the vaping industry. That sounds great. Thank you. So, Society Jane, we like to call it the Good Girls Cannabis Club. It's a livery service in the Bay Area. And we try to buy products and sell products that women make and enjoy. Of course, we deliver to anyone, no matter what gender they are, but we stand out from the rest of the delivery services by um, having a a real high-touch type business. We tend to answer a lot of questions for people. People invite us in when we come to deliver. They want to know how things work. They want to know what else they should be buying for their particular needs. And we're happy to fill that niche. So um, it's not just like a regular pizza delivery type delivery service where you order online and people drop it off, give you the money and leave. This is a much more interactive um, relationship building kind of delivery service. So do you um, solicit feedback on the products themselves and and get consumer input for the the products that you're delivering? We do. We do. We tend to get a lot of feedback from customers about the products we're delivering. We've eliminated plenty of items from our inventory based on that feedback and have added additional items based on that feedback as well. So your business does not um, manufacture or extract. You simply buy and sell? That's correct. So we, we started out before adult use regulation in California. We, started, we got our first license in 2015, and we were a collective, which was the legal entity at that time. And we primarily went into people's homes, kind of like Tupperware parties, and did a little Cannabis 101 presentation for the people who were gathered. And then they could buy directly from us at those parties. 
since adult use regulation went into effect in January of 2018, those types of parties where you sell directly are no longer legal under the regs. So now we still do the Cannabis 101 presentations at parties and people gather there, but it's a different model where people now have to order at the parties for next day delivery. Um, so we still get a lot of feedback from people, but it's not quite as immediate as it used to be. Gotcha. Well, Andy, let me ask you a question. In addition to uh, uh, what you've described, um, I know from talking with you that you will also uh, uh, help people host like the equivalent of a Tupperware party, but for people to come over and, and see the various types of uh, cannabis products that you guys are selling and, and hear a little bit more about them from you? Yes. We, d we still do a lot of that. We um, go to people's homes. We go to businesses. We go to social clubs. We just went to uh, the sisterhood kickoff meeting for a uh, synagogue in Oakland and did a Cannabis 101 presentation for them. And we bring products with us that people can look at and and try topicals, things like that, but um, they cannot buy directly at those events. But we still do the, the sort of Tupperware party model, yes. So kind of helping uh, change people's minds to some degree on uh, how they view marijuana and uh, uh, make it a little more normal and accepted in the community? I believe that's true. I think that um, what we're finding is that a lot of our customer base tends to be either new users or returning consumers, people who maybe, you know, smoked a little pot in college, but they haven't really done it since then. And now they're in their 50s and 60s, and they're curious now that it's legal about what it can do for them. And so there's a lot of re-education that we take care of for people and, um Actually, that leads right into the, the vape situation because we've had to be uh, very proactive about educating people about vape safety on top of other things. But that's certainly on people's minds right now. So what exactly are you um, saying to, the, uh, to your customers when they are asking you questions? Well, first, I guess, what kind of questions are you getting and what kind of answers are you giving? The, uh, about vaping specifically, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the questions we're getting are probably the same questions that people all over the country are asking, which is, those pens that I bought from you a month ago, are those safe for me to use? Or those pens that I bought from you five months ago, or can I buy a new pen from you and is that safe to use? And so what we're telling people is that um, as you guys have already talked about on your show several times, most of the issues with illnesses that are coming from vape pens are from unlicensed, unregulated, black market products. And so we tell people to stay away from those products and to buy from licensed, regulated dispensaries or delivery services because we have those in California. Um, as a retailer, we can only buy products that have been tested. So the, every single cartridge or pre-filled vape pen that comes into inventory has been tested rigorously by state certified labs. We receive certificates of analysis for every single product that comes through our door. We have them on file so that if people want to see the certificates of analysis and the safety issues that have been tested, they have easy access to those. We can provide them upon delivery. We can email them to people. Um, very few people actually ask to see them, but they like to know that we have them. And most people seem... Uh, 100% reassured once we explain to them that the products we're getting have been tested. Um, so that seems to that seems to be enough for most people. That said, vape pens and cartridges have traditionally been about 20% of our total sales over the last several years, and we've definitely seen that number go down in the last few months. 
And in fact, I was just doing some online research to try to figure out what the statewide statistics were. Um, besides our 20%, I wanted to know if it had extended beyond into the whole industry in California. And at that moment, when I was getting my information, all the power went out because of the fires in Northern California. So I won't have that answer for you right now because I have no power. Understood. Well, that's a, that's as good a reason as any. Um, but that's interesting. So you've actually seen a drop in sales. Has any of the uh, manufacturers of the products reached out to you as a retailer of their product to uh, to talk to you about this or to give you any talking points that you can use or pass along to your customers? That's a great question. Yes, I would say every single manufacturer of cartridges and pre-filled pens has provided us with a statement of safety that they've put out. Um, every one of them has, we've, we've compiled them all and been able to give them to people. So when people have bought a specific product, we can give them not only our own safety statement, but that of the manufacturer whose product they now possess. So every single one of them has been very proactive about making it clear that you know, they don't use vitamin E acetate and they don't use any fillers and um, they've provided additional COAs, certificates of analysis to prove that. So, yeah, they have really been on top of it. Which is good. And that's something that, that Jim and I have been talking about. And I'll let him jump in in a minute here uh, was the need for the industry to really step forward and assert itself proactively so that rather than sitting around and, and being victim to however the press chooses to report it, uh, you know, they can come forward and, and make these kind of statements and demonstrate to people why their products are safe with the hope that a prohibitionists don't wind up using these types of circumstances as a means to try to justify elimination of all of the positive ground that uh, medical and adult use have made over the past few years. Yes. And at least in California, that's what we've seen. We've seen the industry is being very proactive about it. Um, and, you know, understandably nervous about just exactly what you were saying about the prohibitionists using this as ammunition to get the whole vape industry to go away. But I don't really think that's going to happen. And I think that there's probably going to be some pretty strong lobbying if that's if an effort is made to do that. Sure. Sure, you have a few questions. Um, um, low THC hemp based products as well? So under our license, we are not allowed to sell anything but cannabis derived products. So we can't sell hemp derived CBD as a licensed retailer in California. I see. Yes, that's similar to Colorado, where you can't sell hemp-based products uh, in a dispensary. Mm -hmm. And then, but the I think other, people yeah. have people have gotten around that by creating a second entity where they can sell hemp-based products. They just need sure. the resources to do something like that, like online. Uh, there are a couple of delivery services I know that have created a second website where people can order hemp-derived CBD products separate from their other cannabis-derived product website. I see. I see. And it seems like this, the spike we had in um, people getting sick and lung infections and the unfortunate case where people have passed away, that seems to have ebbed over the last month or so. Do, do you agree, Andy? Uh, that's what I've read. I mean, from everything I've seen, it seems to have ebbed. And... In California, I believe it has as well. Um, but I think there's still a lot of testing going on. I know that the state agencies in California are currently testing how the hardware, even in legal and licensed um, vape pens, how the hardware interacts with the oil. Even though the oil's been tested, now they're checking how it interacts with the hardware to make sure that that's not leaching heavy metals into people. So we're still waiting for the results of those tests, I think. Um, but to your point, in the meantime, 
I think that the illnesses and certainly the deaths have gone down. That is always good to hear as well. Um, it is. I, I think that the, the primary thing that's going on is that people need to be educated about not going into unlicensed, unregulated dispensaries and using delivery services that don't have licenses and buying cheaper products through those entities because that's really how people are getting sick. And there was an article that just came out yesterday that <laughs> some reporters from Leafly did where they went and bought illegal disposable vape cartridges from unlicensed stores in Los Angeles and had them tested by a licensed testing lab. And the results were kind of amazing. Like some oils tested had over 5,000 times the legal limit of pesticides in them. So I think that right. message needs to be screamed from the rooftop so that people are very careful about where they buy their products. Sure, so you said sure. that's something that you guys do with your plants. That is something that we do with our clients. We, we warn them a lot. I see. Yes, and to uh, give you an update, you know, Massachusetts, where I am right now, uh, did a kind of a knee-jerk reaction, has banned all vape pen products, including the tobacco-based ones. And some of the unintended consequences, it's really, you know, for the marijuana people, they can always, you know, switch to another cannabis-based product, be it flower or edible. Uh, the cigarette people who are using vape pens to get off the cigarettes or as a replacement for cigarettes, they're freaking out. And uh, across the border from Massachusetts and New Hampshire, they cannot keep their uh, nicotine-based inhalers uh, on the shelf. People are coming up from Massachusetts and buying them by the dozen. So that's what's going on here. Hopefully this ban will be lifted soon. But as of right now, I believe it's a six-month moratorium on all e-cigarette product sales. Wow. Oh. Yeah, well, Jim, is, is Massachusetts the only state that's doing that? I thought there were others that were banning everything as well. Well, we, we have some clients up in Oregon who are very happy that they did not institute a ban there. They did put a ban on the flavored uh, varieties, uh, the fruit flavored uh, nicotine and THC products. But um, Oregon still has it. Colorado has not done anything as of yet. Uh, I think most states are taking a wait and see approach uh, because it ha has been very effective as far as getting people off cigarettes, whether they're using a THC based product or a nicotine based product. Uh, it really is one of the things that uh, seems to be working for those people who really want to quit smoking cigarettes. Interesting. Um, Andy. Uh, just switching subjects for a minute, but as long as we have a uh, an actual um, uh, owner of a marijuana uh, business with us, one of the things that Jim and I were just talking about in our last episode is what seems to be the IRS's creep in expanding the scope of 280E. But as somebody who's engaged in the retail sale of, uh, of, of marijuana, uh, you probably have a little bit of experience with 280E, have you not? Oh, yes. We've had a lot of experience with 280E. Are you are you talking about them expanding the breadth of 280E or shrinking it down? It's expanding. Expanding, yeah, that will be a problem. But I mean, already we but, have but very few have, things that we can deduct. Ahead, right, and so that's like a whole brand new business model for people who want to run your type of businesses. Uh, yeah, it's a whole new business model. It's, you know, we, our accountants are wonderful and we work with them all the time to try to figure out how to stay within the confines of 280E, but still try to deduct some normal business expenses. And it's not easy. No, it's not. Uh, in fact, I attended a seminar today by a pretty well known attorney, Nick Richards. Uh, formerly with the IRS, uh, and he did a pretty deep dive into the, it's the alternative health case that came out a few months ago, basically saying that um, if you have, uh, you know, just by moving some 2EDE expenses over to another entity, it's not going to make them deductible. Uh, and the results have been pretty devastating because what ended up happening in that case was the 
deductions were disallowed at the entity level, the cannabis touching the plant, but also their management company. They basically said it's the same company, and therefore the management company is touching the plant as well. So the, the takeaway from that is beware of management companies and your corporate structure. Uh, the IRS is going to look at what that person does and not um, who pays them. Who pays them is not relevant. If that person is dispensing cannabis uh, uh, in a dispensary setting, their salary uh, is not going to be allowed under 280E to be deductible. So the um, another case to be wary here uh, for cannabis business. Well, Jim, and you and I talked about that case a little bit on our last show, right? And, and, and now that you're talking about it again, this time I'm better clued in uh, because what you're really saying is uh, in that instance, it wasn't just that the management company was ancillary to the marijuana business. It's that they were actually taking a position that could be viewed as operating the marijuana business, which is kind of the distinguishing factor you mentioned last time. It shields professionals like attorneys and accountants. Yes. Yeah. They, I mean, the takeaway is there might be many good uses for a management company uh, to be associated with a cannabis touch the plant company. But avoiding 280E is not one of them. Got it. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Um, well, with the time we have, we not have found left, a good way to avoid 280E. I think it's, it's something you we're know, always going to have to deal with, and people like it to comes there to down bail us to. Out. Yes. Um, you know, one of the takeaways. I don't want to get too technical on this show, but uh, many of us who uh, advise on corporate structure in the space are now pretty big fans of C corporations because the owner is not personally liable for the taxes. If there's an audit, it doesn't affect the personal tax returns of the owners. And uh, the corporate tax rate is now 21%. So especially if you're on the retail side, uh, cultivators are not as affected by 280E uh, as are retailers. Uh, so if you have a retail business, you know, get a good CPA, get a good lawyer, uh, talk to the Hoban Law Firm here and Larry or myself over at Bridge West. I would be glad to talk to you about some of the benefits of being a C corporation, especially under the new 21% tax rate. That makes sense. Actually, after the adult use regulations went into place in 2018, we saw a big rush of retailers who had previously been working as not-for-profits switching to C-Corps, probably just for that reason. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of good reasons to be a C-Corp. Among the many are that if your business fails, uh, you don't have to pay your, your income tax bill uh, to, for that C-Corporation. Well, on the other hand, if a um, pass-through entity like a partnership fails, uh, the taxes stick to you personally. And Jim, how does all yeah. of that balance off against the double taxation that a C Corp faces? Well, the C Corp, the double taxation really kicks in upon the sale of the business, but there are some holding periods um, that if you hold the business for four or five years. Uh, you can actually uh, eliminate some of those corporate taxes or all of those corporate taxes upon the sale of the business. So some, the new tax act uh, that was passed last year really has uh, made the C-Corp a significantly more advantageous vehicle than a pass-through entity. Okay. Let's, um, enough, enough of this dry, boring accounting stuff. Let's, uh, let's talk some Grateful Dead. Okay. Please. Well, I, I can I can read this off by saying that you know Andy started seeing the dead right around the same time I did, and um, in fact, uh, well, I'll let you talk about it, Andy. You know, tell us about some of your favorite shows that you've been to. <laughs> Larry, were you at the St. Paul show that might have been my first one in 1981? Um, I was. I thought it was 1983, though. Oh, you're right. It was 1983. It was 1983. And then we all went down to Chicago um, and went to the Poplar Creek shows. Poplar Creek. Yes, we did. That was fun. That was fun. Yep, those were I, great shows. This was a hard thing for me to think about because I had so many favorites. 
Um, I have to say, my very first Greek run in 1984, I have to lump it all together as my favorite weekend instead of picking one favorite show, although the Sunday show of that 1984 Greek run was pretty amazing. They opened the show with Why Don't We Do It in the Road into Birdsong, and then later on, one of my favorite Uncle John's bands ever, and it was my first time at the Greek, and on Friday, I think, they also played my very first Dark Star, which was great. So I know, I can't remember if you were at that run or the 1985 Greek I was there in 1985 for the 20th anniversary shows. Yeah, and that was pretty amazing, too. Those were great shows, too. Big fun. Great show. Jim, did you ever see them at the Greek theater? No, I never saw the Greeks. Saw a bunch of Red Rock shows. Uh, We're all the same era. Uh, Might be a couple years older. My first show was January of 79. Uh, One of my favorite stories to tell is that I was lucky enough to see one of the very last Keith and Donna shows at Springfield Civic Center, January of 79. And five months later, they played a a spring tour of um, spring concerts at university. So they played in our UMass football stadium um, in May of 79, May 12th of 79. And that was one of the first Brett Midland shows. So I I caught that transition and uh, again, got to see Keith and Donna before they uh, they left the band. And then one of the first Brett Brett Midland shows. Um, But uh, rest of that story is uh, my girlfriend at the time had bought me that ticket for Christmas of 78. The, the show was a month later, um, January of 79. And that girl has been my wife of almost uh, 40 years. Well, okay. That's such a good so that's story. A story. Absolutely. Well, well, there's lots of good stories over time. And we, we love sitting around trading uh Creating stories about him on this show, so it's always nice, and uh, you know we can bring somebody else in to give us uh, yet another perspective on it all. But uh, like I say, Andy and I saw many shows together too, and uh, had a very good time. In fact, it was that '85 Greek Theater run, I believe, that after the third night, uh, we had enjoyed some treats from our good friend from Arizona, who later ran into a little bit of trouble, as I recall. Uh, we were all partying at some house in Berkeley, and I realized I had to get myself out to San Francisco Airport for my Red Eye flight home, and Andy was kind enough to drive me across the bridge back to San Francisco where we were staying to pick up my stuff and then get me out to the airport. And I did actually make the Red Eye flight home and was the only person awake on the plane the whole way home. So uh, obviously, been having a good time, but uh, it's those kind of fun moments that we like to reflect on. I remember that drive across the Bay Bridge to get you to the airport on time. That yes. was, we did it. Adventure. <laughs> we did. We're here. I also Great. remember at nice that dinner. Greek show, Larry, it was really hot out, and somebody had brought bagels, cream cheese, and lox, and oh, yes. it was either you or, or our <laughs> friend Jack who was using the lox, the wrapped up lox, as a cold compress to beat the heat. Right. Well, that's, you know, you have to do what you that's have funny. to do. Um, that's funny. And then uh, uh, the Andy's married to another uh, very good friend of mine, uh, Alex Wellens, who's also a big deadhead, and uh, maybe we'll have him on the show sometime to share some of his stories. Uh, he's quite the music uh, aficionado and, and has lots of good stories to share. And, uh, Jim, you'll be happy to know that, like uh, your kids and my kids, Andy's kids have also uh, uh, crossed that bridge with them and have gone to shows. And, in fact, her son Max is quite the uh, musician in Boulder where he regularly performs with his uh, saxophone at the Fox Theater. Thanks for mentioning oh, well, that. He does. Well, and how old, how old is Max? Max is a, he's 21. He's a senior at CU Boulder, and um, he play, has played jazz saxophone since junior high. And uh, one of his friends is a DJ. So they do these shows where the DJ spins, and Max plays live saxophone along with whatever the DJ is spinning. Well, that's great. Uh, our younger son, Jack, is also 21 and a senior at CU Boulder. Uh, makes me wonder if oh. their paths may have crossed, because Jack plays keyboards in a, um, a fish tribute band called Kings of Prussia. I'm going to ask, Matt, ask 
Max if he's seen them. I bet he has. They might. They have a standing Thursday night gig in Denver at a place called Be On Key. Be On Key. I'll tell them. I wonder if they know each other. They probably do. Maybe they do. Yeah, maybe they do. So, uh, well, world of well, yes, if you're ever out in Boulder uh, visiting your son, please uh, look me up and we'll, we'll get together. As Larry knows, I have a nice place in the country with a very nice barn. Uh, which we enjoy very much. Wonderful place to to spend an afternoon. Great. I will take you up on that. I would love to see the barn and meet you in person. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we're coming towards the end of our time. Um, Larry, um, I am going to be getting on a plane here shortly to head back to Colorado. So I am going to let you close out the show. I appreciate it. Safe travels to you, Jim, and we'll talk to you next time. Uh, special thanks to Andy Greenberg for for uh, agreeing to be on our show today and uh, sharing all of her good information with us. Uh, Society Jane is the name of her company, and uh, anybody who's out that way, please uh, consider looking her up and doing some business uh, with her company. I'm sure you'll be very pleased. Andy, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Jim, for having me. This has been fun. Great. Okay. Well, until next time, signing off and uh, talk to you guys next week. My name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.